Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Angus. I, I was struck actually at the start of uh, Angus's address, ladies and gentlemen, that he, he referred to our capital city by the old traditional populist name of uh, Old Riki. Uh, and I've been sitting there thinking if that title is any longer compatible with our low carbon targets. Uh, so after a quick consultation with the Edinburgh Chambers of Commerce, uh, we've decided to rename in popular terms uh, Edinburgh as Old Low Riki, a bracket fully compatible with carbon reduction targets, close bracket. Uh, this is a other innovation from the Scottish Government, ladies and gentlemen. But I, I'd like to uh, thank uh, the Chamber of Commerce for organising the event, to Scottish Enterprise, Highlands and Islands Enterprise, Scottish Futures Trust, the Scottish European Green Energy Centre, and to the main sponsors, all the sponsors listed up there, uh, including, of course, Lloyd's TSB Scotland. There have also been a, a, a large number of... Uh, attended events, smaller events, uh, uh, during the last 12 months, uh, stimulated by the, the Low Carbon Investment Conference. Now, I'm grateful to, to all the people who helped uh, organise these because, of course, one of the, the themes that we, uh, or one of the initiatives that we decided on in previous conferences was to make sure that the conversations that took place at this conference actually ran through the, the whole year. Uh, and thanks, uh, above all, to the delegates for coming. One of the other key points we took on board last year was the need to make this a truly international gathering and it's very encouraging to see delegates here from so many European countries uh, and also from uh, Korea, Japan, uh, Dubai and Abu Dhabi and I want to particularly welcome Ron Hisselar from Mazda Power in Abu Dhabi who will give uh, his keynote uh, address shortly to, to the conference. Uh, in January uh, I addressed the World Future Energy Summit which was organised by Mazda uh, I was particularly struck by Ban Ki-moon's speech, which launched 2012 as the year of sustainable energy for all. He said, uh, Ban Ki-moon said, quote, we need to scale up successful examples of clean energy and energy efficient technologies, and we need leadership, leadership from government, from the private sector, from investors, and from civil society. Ban Ki-moon acknowledged Scotland is working to provide some uh, of that leadership, and we're determined to do so in partnership with the private sector and indeed with other nations. And the cooperation agreement that we signed with Mazda in January is a good example of such partnerships. Now, what I want to do today is to, to set out how Scotland intends to play a lead role in that low carbon revolution, just as uh, a couple of centuries back we played a lead role in the industrial revolution. And doing so, I want to talk about the steps to support investment in new technologies about the importance of our oil and gas industry to the growing renewable energy success story. There are some people who believe that, uh, that hydrocarbons, oil and gas, uh, is incompatible with a move to low carbon energy. Uh, I want to argue today that the skills, the expertise uh, that we have in our offshore oil and gas industry in Scotland is actually crucial to mobilise uh, in developing low carbon technologies. First, however, I want to set out some of the key areas where we've made progress since last year's successful gathering. Uh, Angus uh, McCrone has just uh, reminded us that uh, uh, economics investment is often a, a bumpy path, uh, and therefore it's useful to reflect in, uh, uh, on some of the successes that have been achieved, often against headwinds in terms of uh, international investment. We have seen in Scotland major investments in renewable energy, including significant announcements from leading international and indeed Scottish companies such as Gamesa, Samsung, Global energy. In total, Scottish Renewables estimates the renewable energy sector in Scotland has seen a 2.8 billion sterling of investment over the last four years, uh, and that has meant that Scotland's place at the forefront of research into renewable uh, technology was underlined in February with the announcement of the offshore renewable energy catapult centre uh, to be based at Strathclyde University in Glasgow. Last month, we, we launched the Grand Challenge phase of the Saltair Prize, the largest marine energy challenge prize in the world. Uh, at this moment, there are more wave and tidal power devices are being tested in the waters around Scotland than any other country in the world. We're also looking at grid infrastructure. In February, Ofgem announced the biggest upgrade in Scotland's electricity infrastructure for 60 years, with more than £7 billion of investment from Scottish Power and Scottish and Southern Energy, and that will quadruple Scotland's export capacity to the rest of the United Kingdom by 2018. Now, the importance of having that capacity, ladies and gentlemen, was heavily underlined on Friday 
uh, by release of Ofgem's latest forecasts. And what that showed was that UK electricity generation capacity might exceed peak demand by only 4% in 2015, rather than the rather more comfortable 14% today. I'll just repeat that figure, that the latest forecast from Ofgem is that the, the capacity, electricity capacity in the United Kingdom will exceed peak demand by 4%. Uh, the, uh, if we assume uh, a return to growth in the UK economy, and I know <laughs> this is an interesting assumption to make these days, uh, but if we let's assume that uh, the, uh, the uh, intention is not uh, to, uh, uh, to keep the lights on by having low growth in the UK economy, but the intention is both to keep the lights on and to have growth uh, in the UK economy, then a 4% margin by 2015 is extremely tight uh, indeed. The equivalent figure in Scotland, uh, much higher, uh, in terms of installed capacity exceeding peak demand, it would be about 50%. And what that underlines is to meet future energy needs while meeting renewable and climate emissions targets, that the UK will rely on Scotland for at least 30% of renewable production. That's about three times our capacity share, uh, just as the investment pattern over the last few years has roughly been Scotland has achieved three times our capacity share. But of course, if we're going to produce and to use that renewable energy, it has to be connected, and we need better connections to transport that energy. And that's why the investment in reinforcing onshore grid connections between Scotland and England is so important. And that's why reinforcing offshore grid connections, the West and East Coast bootstraps, as they're called, is absolutely vital. That's why building interconnectors with Europe in the future is going to be vital. Uh, clean, green energy from Scotland will play a crucial role in keeping the lights on south of the border as part of an integrated energy market with the rest of these islands and increasingly the rest of Europe. Now, investors, as they always are, are looking for certainty, and indeed they should get it. The Scottish Government's view is that decarbonisation targets should be enshrined in the forthcoming electricity bill. However, the debate on this should also recognise that there is already a firm UK Government target. The UK is committed through the Renewable Energy Directive to meet 15% of its energy consumption from renewable sources. And in the Department of uh, uh, Climate Change uh, roadmap, uh, that means that Scotland has to supply more than a third of the renewable electricity for the rest of the UK. Because of that, we'll increasingly need to transmit electricity from the locations, often remote locations, where renewable energy is abundant, uh, to the areas where it is in most demand. And that's why the grid upgrade announced in February is a necessary step towards this. So too was the opening of the interconnector between Ireland and the UK two weeks ago. But these developments, uh, though welcome, are not in themselves sufficient. For Scotland, grids and interconnectors will be as important to low-carbon revolution as canals and railways were to the industrial revolution. We need further infrastructure, such as the Isles grid between Northern Ireland, Ireland and Scotland, or the proposed North Connect link with Norway. We need these uh, infrastructure developments if we are to fulfil the potential of becoming a green energy powerhouse for the continent of Europe. Now, ladies and gentlemen, one of the most welcome developments of last year was the announcement that the Green Investment Bank will be headquartered here in Scotland. It was, of course, a, a major topic of, uh, of interest uh, at last year's conference. Uh, and I welcome the fact that Lord Smith, the chair of the bank, will give tomorrow's keynote uh, address. The Green Investment Bank's five priorities span a, a range of low-carbon sectors including offshore wind and energy efficiency. And one of the chief issues at last year's conference, and another area which has seen progress in the last year, it was the budgetary announcement from the Scottish budget of a 30 million package to promote household and public sector energy efficiency. We've given as a, a government a, a fair bit of thought to how we can ensure there are good quality projects for the bank to consider as it gets up and running. And therefore, I'm announcing this morning that we're establishing an advisory group to support good ideas and projects for the Green Investment Bank. Uh, the group will help people refine, pitch their proposals, and by doing so, it should enable the Green Investment Bank to start investing quickly in projects which will deliver tangible benefits. 
There's a very important point here. I mean, if we look at uh, the reasons for, for Scotland's industrial preeminence in the 19th and 20th centuries, many of them apply again today to the low-carbon technologies. Uh, then we had a, a good natural resources of coal and iron ore. Now we have extraordinary potential resources of offshore wind, wave and tidal power. Then we had the most educated and therefore the, the most innovative population in Europe. Now we have more universities per head in the world's top 200 than any country bar Switzerland. And the impact of science, engineering and technology research in Scotland is greater relative to our GDP than any other nation in the world. I'll just repeat that, ladies and gentlemen, because we don't always uh, hear that message coming across uh, from our uh, friends in the press corps. The impact of our science, engineering and technology in Scotland is greater relative to our GDP than any other nation on this planet. A further fact, however, is that the in the 19th century, Scotland had the, the most advanced capital markets in the world. Uh, inventions in Scotland were developed rapidly as part, usually, of a commercial process. Similar, in order to succeed today, we've got to ensure that capital markets meet modern needs, that businesses have access to finance so that breakthroughs can be quickly commercialised. And that's exactly the space that this conference fills. That's why this conference exists, to bring together the investment community and the low-carbon industries. It's why the Scottish Government has been such a strong supporter of the Green Investment Bank. It's why the advisory group for the bank's projects is being established. It's a further step to bringing together innovators and investors to encourage new technologies. The importance of new investment is also why we have continuing concerns about the process of electricity market reform. Now, those of you who are veterans of this three-year-old conference remember Two years ago, I appealed rather unsuccessfully to, uh, to retain the, the rocks as a, a, a central feature of future uh, investment. Uh, last year, I, I urged uh, clarity and simplicity in the, uh, in the setting of uh, the contracts for difference in the, in the electricity market reform. Uh, I can say we continue to work closely with the UK Government on this issue. I welcome the fact, in particular, Ed Davey will uh, address this uh, conference uh, tomorrow morning. Uh, the proposed contracts for difference mechanism can be made to work. I've got no doubt about that. But it must ensure that Scottish ministers have a strong and ongoing role in governance arrangements. It also has to encourage rather than hinder investment in renewable energy generation. It must, for example, recognise the enormous potential of remote areas, including offshore islands, to meet our future energy needs. Unless electricity market reform is targeted in achieving this, it will hinder rather than help. And more importantly, it would fail the crucial challenges, the twin challenges of power security in the short term and equally important energy sustainability in the long term. Now, our recognition of the need to provide the right incentives means that Scotland is currently the only country in the world to provide public support for renewable energy all the way from research and development uh, to the making and testing prototypes and then on to commercialisation and to manufacturing. We're also investing in port infrastructure. We have a, a £70 million sterling fund for port and manufacturing facilities for offshore renewables. Just last month, I visited Westway Dock in Renfrew, which will be dredged, cleared and equipped to handle the needs of manufacturers. Renfrew will be one of the very first places to gain in this way. But soon, towns and harbours across Scotland will benefit from renewable energy's potential for the reindustrialisation of the coastline of our country as we start to manufacture, service, maintain the machines that will power Scotland and then much of the continent of Europe over the course of this century. However, despite all of the different kinds of support and assistance we offer, there has, up until now, been a gap, and that gap is for small-scale and marine energy projects. Projects of that kind may not yet be priorities for the Green Investment Bank and therefore could struggle to attract commercial funding. And that's why we announced earlier this year that we would launch uh, a renewable energy investment fund uh, to meet that gap and to close that gap. And that's why I'm pleased to announce today that the, the fund opens for business. It will be managed by the Scottish Investment Bank. It will initially focus on supporting wave and tidal arrays, renewable district heating, projects by local community organisations. 
will believe that it will leverage in significant additional investment beyond the Scottish Government's £100 million commitment in each of these three areas. The Fund will prioritise projects that are likely to generate electricity before 2017. We expect the initial awards to be made by the end of this financial year. I expect it to make a significant difference in securing new investment and accelerating the deployment of new technology. Now, that fund, the Renewable Energy Investment Fund, is being created from half of the money which came to Scotland from the fossil fuel levy, a long, important and ultimately successful struggle uh, to get half of our money back. However, the remaining half went to a good cause because that was our contribution to the capitalisation of the Green Investment Bank. Uh, I think there is something hugely appropriate uh, about the fact that a, a duty on carbon-based energy is being used as a starter fund uh, for low-carbon technological development. Now, I have mentioned three of Scotland's key strengths in this field – our natural resources, our research and skills base, and access to funding. But there is a, a final piece of the jigsaw, and that is the piece that makes Scotland one of the best places in the world to invest in renewable energy projects. It is our history, and that history and expertise in engineering and manufacturing, especially in the last four decades from our oil and gas industry offshore. As countries like Denmark show, there is no contradiction between making use of substantial, in their case, gas reserves which are needed by the rest of the, the world over the coming decades, eh, while leading the transition to a low-carbon economy. In fact, the oil and gas industry has an important role to play in that transition. Uh, and indeed, hydrocarbon-rich countries ha have an obligation, both moral eh, and of economic opportunity, eh, to lead the way in the transition to the low-carbon uh, economy. Uh, again, let's draw a, a comparison with the 19th and 20th centuries. In shipbuilding, for example, at that time Scotland's main competitive advantage lay in the development of steam engines for ships, something which depended on engineering skills first developed for the older industries of textiles and mining. Something similar, in my estimation, is happening <coughs> in energy today. Due to the great success of our oil and gas sector over the last 40 years, we have a knowledge of engineering in hostile deep water environments which has few rivals anywhere in the world. In fact, ladies and gentlemen, we know more about the waters around our country thanks to thousands of years of a fishing industry and 50 years of an oil and gas industry than any country knows about its territorial waters on this planet. That is a tremendous wealth of human capital and expertise. We also have better knowledge of seabed, coastal waters and tidal currents than any other nation. Following this conference two years ago, after the discussion at the open session, uh, I convened a, a summit in, in Aberdeen at the start of a, an ongoing process to encourage collaboration between the renewable energy sector and the oil and gas sector. We now see the benefits and fruits of that collaboration. There is an increasing number of oil and gas companies such as Subsea 7, Technip uh, and uh, uh, the Wood Group uh, have entered the, the offshore wind market. Uh, and I'm confident that as we start to develop and harness these new technologies for developing energy offshore, offshore wind initially and increasingly deep waters, and then commercial wave and tidal power, that legacy of knowledge and expertise from oil and gas will be a huge competitive advantage to the marine industry of renewable technologies. And let me repeat again, it's not just an economic opportunity. It is a moral imperative, in my estimation, that hydrocarbon countries lead the way in renewable energy technologies. It is worth uh, considering, in conclusion, one other development which has taken place recently. Two, uh, two weeks ago, uh, the European Union passed the milestone of having 100 gigawatts of installed wind power capacity. It took 33 years to get to that point. It was 27 years to reach 50 gigawatts and six years to reach the next 50 to reach 100. It took 33 years in total to get to 100 gigawatts, 27 years to get halfway and then six years to get the next half. That example shows that once technology becomes practical and commercially viable, it can take off remarkably quickly. And some of uh, the uh, 
the slides that were shown to us indicate how dramatically the cost curve for onshore wind is currently moving in the correct direction. Now, large-scale commercial development of wave and tidal power is still some years away, but it will happen and it will create significant opportunities and returns for investors. Offshore wind, however, is much closer to commercial viability. EDP Renewables and Repsol, for example, applied two months ago for consent to build them in the Murray Firth what would be the largest offshore wind farm anywhere in the world. And Scottish Southern Energy are establishing a test site for offshore wind at Hunterson. I'm pleased to announce today that Scottish Enterprise is investing over £4 million in an additional testing site for the Hunterson berth. That berth, in line with our National Renewable Infrastructure Plan, will encourage investors to test and then to manufacture offshore wind technologies in Scotland. And along with the £4 million from Scottish Enterprise, there's a £15 million investment from Scottish and Southern Energy, making a total of a £20 million investment in that vital test facility in the superb location of the deepwater port of Hunterson in the west coast of Scotland. What the Scottish Government or enterprise agencies, all of our public sector partners are seeking to do is to support industry and researchers to accelerate the development of new technologies. One reason for that is economic. The more quickly these technologies become viable, the more quickly people in Scotland <clears throat> and across the world can benefit from the, the jobs and opportunities that they create. But there's another, <clears throat> and it's an even more important, compelling point. Al Gore, in his presentation last year, outlined very clearly the weight of evidence that climate change is happening. As we heard earlier on, the evidence from the last 12 months, including the record summer decline in the extent of Arctic sea ice, serious drought and record wildfires in the United States, the report published by the American Meteorological Society linking warming of the Indian and Pacific Oceans to drought in East Africa, has reinforced this point. Climate change is not a distant, ungraspable threat. It's not a, something that's going to happen to our children and to their children. It's something that's already happening, and its effects are already being felt. In the developed world, these effects are deep disruption, increased inconvenience, and <clears throat> substantial economic costs. In the developing world, the effects, for example, of a change in weather patterns in the Horn of Africa is catastrophic. As the United Nations Human Development Panel said last year, the poorest countries bear many of the costs of climate change, and the prospect of worsening global inequality is therefore very real. It's why I'm proud to say that this country, Scotland, in a modest way but nonetheless an important way, has established the, the first climate justice fund in the Western world. In the context of that global threat, <clears throat> developing low carbon technologies can't be seen just as an economic opportunity, it's also that moral imperative. As a result of our resources, our research base, our financial sector, our engineering expertise, Scotland has the potential to play a leading role in the low-carbon revolution, just as we did in the Industrial Revolution. This confidence, in turn, has an important role in helping us to do that. It enables each and every one of us to take stock of what has been achieved so far, to consider the challenges that we face, and to collaborate in finding solutions to overcome them. This is a hugely important conference. I am delighted uh, to see so many of you here. I look forward to our discussions over the, the next two days, <clears throat> and I'm sure that by the end of uh, this conference, our capital city of Edinburgh will have lived up to its new title of Old Low Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. <clears throat>